28 million years ago, ancient Colorado exploded. Superheated ash and pumice erupted outwards with enough power to leave behind a gaping caldera more than eight times the size of Denver. Clouds of hot ash blanketed the landscape, creating deposits that are still over 300 meters thick today. Eventually, the ash cooled and became a rock known as ignimbrite, a Latin word that means storm cloud of fire. And this particular ignimbrite records an eruption that spewed out twice as much material as Yellowstone's biggest eruption. That's almost 5,000 times as much ash as Mount St. Helens' 1980 eruption. It's known as the Fish Canyon Tuff. And while by today's standards, it seems inconceivably huge, it was one of many in a swarm of supervolcanoes that blanketed North America with ash for millions of years. In fact, the Western US is pockmarked with similarly devastating craters that formed from about 36 million to 18 million years ago. This time period is known to geologists as the mid-tertiary ignimbrite flare-up. And these large-scale eruptions were happening as often as every 10,000 years apart, which would be an absolutely insane pace for a devastating problem. Except it wasn't devastating. There was no big extinction event and there were no smaller ones either. In fact, some of North America's biggest and most continuous fossil records were preserved during this time period, like the John Day fossil beds in Oregon. So how is it possible to have both cataclysmic eruptions, but no real cataclysm? Today, North America's volcanoes mostly sit along its Pacific coast. This so-called ring of fire is formed by plate tectonics, with volcanoes popping out where the oceanic plates like the Pacific plate are being slowly shoved under a continental plate. Now the actual meeting place for these plates is out in the ocean, but the volcanoes are further inland. This is because volcanoes don't form above the spot where the two plates collide. Instead, they develop where the oceanic plate has sunk deep enough to melt from the increased heat of the Earth's mantle. As the plate melts, hot magma rises, and eventually volcanoes form to release some of that pressure. And this same process was taking place back in the Eocene Epoch. An old oceanic plate called the Farallon Plate was sliding underneath the North American Continental Plate, and that had been going on since at least the Jurassic period. But there was one big difference. See, oceanic plates are really heavy compared to continental plates. That's why when the two collide, the oceanic plate always loses. It goes under and sinks fairly fast, turning into magma, continuing the volcanic cycle. So the oceanic Farallon Plate should have been sinking, but it wasn't, or at least it wasn't sinking very fast. It was just kind of bumping up against the bottom of the continental plate, so it didn't melt much. And without much molten magma, the few volcanoes that did form were pretty small. Instead, the scraping of the Farallon Plate caused it to be shoved into the continent, forming the wrinkles that we now call the Rocky Mountains. Which is important, because when the Farallon Plate finally gave up and started to sink around 50 million years ago, it was doing so under a much tougher crust. As the plate finally sank, a whole bunch of new magma rushed in to fill the gaps. But the Continental Plate was much thicker than normal, which meant that there was no easy outlet for the new magma. Instead of quickly erupting upwards, the magma had to melt its way through the thick continental cap. And you might think that slowing down magma is a good thing, but it can actually make eruptions more explosive. Because as the magma slows, it melts the plate around it, which changes its composition. See, continental plates are made of a different material than oceanic ones. They have a lot more silica in them. Silica makes for a sticky, thick magma, and if a magma contains gas bubbles, silica will prevent them from exiting the magma body. So these higher silica magmas build up pressure and pressurized gases, and when they finally reach the surface, they don't just gently puke out lava, they sort of explode. Because the Farallon Plate was pretty big, it left a lot of room for magma as it finally sank, which meant by 33 million years ago, these silica-rich eruptions started happening a lot. Geologists have identified over 230 different eruptions in North America during this period, and at least 25 of them were super volcanic. Together, these eruptions produced enough material that if it was spread out, it could blanket the entire United States 55 meters deep deeper than a 10-story building. 
And while some of that was lava, most of it was massive clouds of hot ash and pumice known as pyroclastic flows, which when they solidify, form ignimbrites. Pyroclastic flows are incredibly dangerous. They can move as fast as 200 meters per second and reach temperatures of hundreds of degrees Celsius. They behave like fluids, and when they are going fast enough, they can jump over barriers like canyon walls as high as 600 meters. Nowhere is this process more obvious and terrifying than in the Fish Canyon Tuff. The eruption released more than 5,000 cubic kilometers of ash, which is why in many areas the deposit is still tens of meters thick or more. Not every eruption during the Ignimbrite flare-up was quite this big, but even an eruption a fifth this size is bigger than any that has happened in more than 25,000 years. Being buried by more than a 10-story building's worth of hot ash seems unsurvivable, especially when it's happening frequently. Yet most North American animals and plants survive. So the question is, how? To answer that, we need to look at how animals survive volcanic eruptions today. Take Mount St. Helens in Washington State, for instance, a much smaller eruption than the ash flows of the Ignimbrite flare-up, but one that has been extensively studied. Mount St. Helens has shown us how some animals can survive these eruptions. Surprisingly easily, it turns out. Firstly, while ash can travel farther and faster than lava can, it's actually easier to deal with because you can dig through it once it's cooled. So one survival strategy is to hide out in your burrow during the eruption and then poke your head up through the ash afterwards. We see this at Mount St. Helens where both pocket gophers and western toads were hiding in their holes and came back out once the ash had cooled. The western toads may have even been hibernating when the eruption actually happened. And animals in lakes have specific strategies too. Explosive eruptions often send debris and trees into lakes further downhill, but an aquatic animal can hide deep enough in the water to not be affected. This is especially true if the volcano erupts when it's still cold, because animals are safe under the ice and avoid debris. This is what we see with some aquatic salamanders at Mount St. Helens, which were tucked safely in the muddy lake bottoms beneath the ice flows and rode the eruption out. What Mount St. Helens and other modern eruptions has shown us is that mammals who can't hide underground, outrun the eruptions, or wait out a food shortage are the most impacted. For example, Mount St. Helens is estimated to have killed about 7,000 big game animals like deer and bears, but larger animals have larger ranges. Though individuals near the eruption will die, other populations of that species will survive, and once the plants return, the big animals will too. And plants grow really quickly in ash deposits. Unlike lava, ash breaks down very easily, and it makes for increased nutrient-rich soils. Ash also helps preserve moisture in the soil, which is important in dry places like the western U.S. Ultimately, ash deposits quickly regain their plants and animals. In fact, studies have found that the animals at Mount St. Helens had completely recovered within about five years of the eruption. Life, uh, finds a way. Which is why the ancient supervolcanic eruptions didn't cause mass extinction. Life is too resilient, and the properties of ash are especially good at helping ecosystems recover. And not only did life survive these supervolcanoes, it actually survived in them. These massive eruptions left craters that filled with water, and these lake systems preserved amazing fossils, like the Creed Formation, a lake deposit that formed in the caldera that birthed the Fish Canyon Tuff. This formation is known for its amazing insect and plant fossils. There's even a fossil bird feather that is so well preserved you can see color banding in it. The supervolcanoes formed fossils indirectly, too. Ash and volcanic mudslides dammed up rivers to form lake fossil sites, like the Florissant Formation, which preserves beautiful trees and plants and even delicate mosses. So far from destroying life at the time, the Ignimbrite flare-up nurtured healthy ecosystems and eventually preserved them well enough for people to study some 30 million years down the line. It turns out life can adapt and carry on against incredible odds, no matter how much ash the earth throws our way. Have you checked out our posters yet? 
Take a journey through millions of years of natural history without ever leaving your room with our classic deep time poster and our Saga of the Supercontinents poster. They are available in the link in the description. We really lava this month's eontologists. Gail Brown, Juan M, Jaxie Weiss, Melanie Lamb Carnavale, Raphael Haza, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davidson Ng, Jake Hart, and Colton. Become an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons and you can get fun perks like submitting a joke for us to read, like this one from Andrew and Sarah. Andrew, did you know that the Phosphotherium was an ancient elephant ancestor that had no trunk? Sarah, no trunk? How did it smell? Andrew, terrible. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> what is it? Phosphotherium. Phosphotherium. Cool. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Adam Lowe studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more epic epochs. I keep wanting to say magma like Austin Powers. Magma. Oceans made of magma. <laughs> Every time I read the word. <laughs> magma. All right.